each service that God uh, gives me a truth for me. And each service, he's done that. When I started up in Springfield and uh, when I went there, the Lord said, every meeting has a purpose. And it's just one line. But then I started thinking, that's true. So what that allows me to do is seek the purpose. And, uh, and then to jump in the river, he talked about jumping in the river and to bring my supply. So, man, I'm ready. So I've been prayed up, and I'm ready. I'm on the bank. As soon as he rolls, I'm jumping in. So I'm going to get everything God has for me. So I'd encourage you today uh, that God's brought Dr. Tan for a specific reason and a purpose. Uh, It's not just a message. uh, It's more than that. It's an impartation that he's going to be dropping into the church and for each one of us. So you can just come on up, Dr. Tan, and uh, you take your liberty, take your time. And we've just had a wonderful time so far, yeah. and he's just going to bring the word you had as far as. Thank, Thank you. Guys, good morning. Good morning. Um, before I get anywhere even into what we want to talk about this morning, I want to say publicly and for all of you to hear, GC, you did a great job hosting this. You did. With excellence, and you could feel the heart of what God has for the whole conference. You really did, you know, and, and pastors, uh, thank you so much for stepping up and doing this. I see these meetings as a seed from the church for the surrounding and not just for this church, you know, and at some point, somebody has to step up and say, we'll, we'll maintain and we'll raise the standard for the word in this place. Somebody has to do that. And that's, that's where the sacrifice comes in because when you're doing that, sometimes it looks like no one else is doing it. You might be the only one. That's what pioneering does. Pioneering makes common what was uncommon. You understand that? So, so, so thank you guys. I, I, I cannot tell you how thrilled I was when you started talking to me about this. And on the inside, I was like a little kid in the candy store. And, um, well, I'm kind of that way when I'm even not in the candy store, but uh, especially if I'm in the candy store, right? And I thought, wow, if they do this, I'll be, I'll be so, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm just rearing to go and I'll just be so excited. And, um, uh, but you all did it and you did it well. And you did it with excellence and with the love of God. All of you did. And I know it takes more than one person to make something like this happen. I know it does, you know. And when I, when I saw the other pastors who were here last night, all of whom I know, because they had all been over there with me in, in, in Springfield, uh, Springfield, Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't mean I know where I am right now, but I know that they were in Springfield, Illinois. Um, and when I saw all of them, they were, they were on purpose. Listen now, they were on purpose touring your building because they, they were planning how they wanted to do their place. And they were on purpose asking uh, different ones about the sound and the because I, I talk about you guys. So the last week when you all were up there, I told them I said you should go see their place and how they do the videos. You should. I I told them that. So they all came on purpose. Listen, they came on purpose to see how you all do church. Think about that. So so so. Uh, my heart's just thrilled, 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 you know. My, my only one little regret is that with the four services, I won't be able to... I'm echoing. You're fixing it? Okay. Should I just go on talking or should I just pretend to stand here and look pretty? <laughs> I, I, I know, well, I know that, but I'm just saying... <laughs> I know that. It's, it's what I do. <laughs> Um, my, my one little regret coming in was that I knew right from the get-go that with four services, we wouldn't get much into end time anything. But, <laughs> pause for a picture while they're, while they're working that out. I can use the handheld or I can just yell at you all without a microphone. Yeah, I'm okay. You want me to do without that? Do I turn it off? Yeah. Is it off now? Good morning, I'm back on. And so, um, but if you, if you go back, and I'm so thankful for the videos that they have on out there. I've been, I've been going back and watching every single one and the quality, you would not know. Who would know that that, that all came from, um, uh, from a cell phone? There's no way, I mean, just, it's wild. 
So if you would just um, go back and watch those videos, you'll find that the Spirit of God has been bringing an emphasis about prophesying and speaking. And again, that is an end time sign. That in itself is an end time sign for people like you and I, common everyday folk who get to have the Spirit of God on us and speak forth by inspiration and utterance from heaven. That is an end time sign. And more importantly, that is an end time sign to the church of which you and I are a part. I don't just mean GC, I mean the universal body of Christ. So that is an end time sign right there. And really, that is an end time sign that you and I need to focus on. Again, not ignoring the famine, not ignoring the earthquake, not ignoring the wars, not ignoring Israel, not ignoring any of that. But we've got to understand that the sign for the church is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's right. Good. And when I focus on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, because that's a sign to me in the church that something is happening, then I get to, I get to stay in my lane and not be di diverted and distracted by everything else that's happening in every other lane. So when believers who want to know about the end times but are looking at signs for everyone else, they end up in the wrong location called Fearville. And they stay and then they and then they get afraid because they're like, oh my lord, there's gonna be there's earthquake, there's famine. All of those things are supposed to happen, but that doesn't change Psalm 91 over your life. That, that doesn't change the fact that God's your father. He intends to provide for you. He intends to protect you. He intend, all of that doesn't change. Why? Because over there, he might be God. Over there, he might be king. Over there, he might be creator. Over there, he might be judge. But over here, he's father. So we got to understand that that is, for us, the end time sign. The outpouring of the Spirit of God began by declaration of Peter quoting the prophet Joel who was quoting Moses that the end time sign would be the outpouring of the Spirit of God on common everyday folk. And the proof of that was 120 in the upper room. They spoke in tongues, but Peter by unction called it prophesying. Now we know that tongues and interpretation of tongues equals prophesying. So Peter again was, was you see, don't you love how scripture kind of brings itself together? And when, and when you read enough of it, you understand that really when one says one thing, actually it could mean that other thing, it's just different language. Now, the Bible you have in your lap is a third prophecy. So if we don't have a grasp of prophecy, you need to be prepared to rip a third of this book right out right now because a third of this is prophecy. And can I tell you that the Bible is the only book that has such an emphasis on prophecy. A lot of other books have good sayings, nice sayings, nice ideas, perhaps some moral teaching. But our Bible, our God specializes in telling you the end from the beginning. And that's the divine blueprint right there. The divine thumbprint right there on, on what we call the Bible. So the Bible is not, it is a historical document, it is a geographical, it, it's all of that, it's scripture, but what, what, what sets it apart from a lot of the other books is this aspect of prophecy. Now, why do a lot of people shy away from talking about prophecy? Because, because prophecy, in order to be understood, you really have to have a grasp of the whole counsel of God. In other words, you cannot just grab a hold of one verse and run with it and base your entire end time ideology on the one verse. Because every, the way prophecy come about is that prophecy comes about in, in line upon line, bit upon bit, slice upon slice. So, you, so no, no one prophetic utterance tells you everything. You, you got to be able to piece it together. In other words, if you really wanted to jump in, it's going to require a little study. But when you do jump in and when you do study it, you see the, the magnificent magnitude of all that God is in that he can take one, what we call one book, which really is more than 66 books. Actually, we, we categorize it into 66 books, but really it's actually more than 66 books because the Psalms alone it, it, uh, um, for the Hebrew nation, they consider five books. So our 66 isn't exactly accurate. We call it 66, but really it's more, it's, it's, it's more than that. So, but only God could take this one book, this now, and have 40 authors, most of whom who did not know each other or did not spend time talking to each other, and yet all have a cohesiveness in what they were saying. 
and they live, and they didn't all live in the same town. They didn't even all live in the same year. And yet there is a cohesiveness to what they all say. That, that, now, that's the other thing about the Bible that's unique. It has more than one author, human author, more than one human author. And yet there is a cohesiveness in what they all said. Again, that, that sets it apart. That makes it unique from a lot of other isms and ideological literature. Because a lot of those are usually written from the one person. So then, of course, and even when you read a lot of those other books, even though it's usually written by one person, they don't, he doesn't always agree with himself as he's writing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So he'll contradict himself back and forth. But not so with this. You've got over 40 authors over a span of thousands of years, and yet they agreed with each other, not having known each other, and in some cases didn't even reach, read each other's scrolls. So you, you notice that in every book of the Bible, someone will say something that adds another picture to what God was intending to do. And the reason why none of them knew the whole picture was because they were all miles apart and years apart when they gave their little slice. Yeah. Now, you and I, 2022, we come together and we have the privilege of gathering all their slices so we can see what the pie looked like. Yeah. You understand that? But back then, because they could only see just the one slice, just the one jigsaw piece, they, they couldn't tell what was happening. Which is why when Jesus came, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, which is why when Jesus came, there was much debate because he seemed to fulfill some of the prophecies, but then they were unsure if he fulfilled the other prophecies. That was part of the reason why they rejected him. But now us, when we, when we, when we look backwards that way, when we look backwards into what they were looking forward into, we can see the composite picture of how Jesus fulfilled everything that they were trying to get to in the Old Testament. That was prophecy. You see, God, God's prophecies, the prophecies that God brings forth, isn't just by what he said. It was by the acts that he inspired them to do. So in other words, God wasn't just verbal with his prophetic utterances. He was also dramatic with his prophetic utterances. So when you look back at, the, at every sacrifice and every feast that the Hebrew nation would be involved in, you see, when they brought the sacrifice of the lamb and they brought the sacrifice of what else all they brought, in their mind, it was just a sacrifice. But they did not know that in that sacrifice, there was a prophetic picture of the Messiah to come. So God was actually, even in telling them to bring a sacrifice, even in that, there was actually a prophetic utterance come forth, except that they did not know. So every time that they would bring a sacrifice to the priest, they were in effect walking out a prophetic act. But they know it. So, so, so every time, any sacri any time the high priest will lay hand on the sacrificial lamb and, and, and commit the sins of the people, he did not have an idea that the day would come when the Messiah would come do that for him. Because they were expecting the Messiah to come and again, rid them of the Romans, is what they were thinking. They were, they were expecting a military Messiah. Why was this? Because all, the bulk of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, listen now, was not the Messiah coming for the Gentile uh, 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 body or for, come, for the church. It was about the Messiah coming at the end when he would rid the world of, of all evil. So they were thinking, well, he's going to come on and wipe out. And as far as, as far as they were concerned, the evilest people they could think of was probably those Romans. Had to be them. If it was going to be anybody, that's who it is. Right? And then maybe followed, maybe followed after that, maybe followed by those, those Samarians, uh, Samaritans. Why? Because the Samaritans were people who believed they were the real Jews. So the, the Samaritans had their own temple. They had their own high priest, which is why when Jesus met the woman at the, at the well, John 4, she said, what are you doing asking me for water? Jews don't talk to us, yeah. Samaritans. And the moment that Jesus talked anything with her at all about anything spiritual, she right away said, you say this mountain's the right one to worship, we say that mountain's the right one to worship. So she was already thinking religion above everything else. Which is the other reason why, don't you love Jesus doing this? Which is the other reason why when Jesus told the parable of the good Samaritan, he made the Samaritan the good guy. That alone must have shocked a couple of Jews. Like, we know you're a false prophet now. That <laughs> no, Samaritan's a good, there's no way those people... So in their mind, they had that set up, and they were politically, very politically involved. 
uh, if you all came to Israel and saw the people there, you would see even now they are, there is a passion about them for the land. Mm -hmm. And I, I, was telling, um, I was telling you all uh, at, at the conference, I don't remember which service, because after a while you were in your conferences, all the services run into one especially when you're in a three-hour service, like we were last night, and they've just basically got the one service. But, but Israel as a nation, again, consider this, they have been scattered, persecuted, butchered in so many ways, dispersed. In fact, the word is dysphoria. They were dispersed, literally. And yet in 1948, when they came back together, they, they retained the same language, the same culture, the same thought patterns, they, they can't. Why? Because God said, I'll preserve you. Historically, they are the only culture on the earth that are that way. None of us are. Because if, if any of us, if you would trace us back far enough to our granddad and great granddad and great great granddad and wherever they came from, I carry none of that culture. I don't speak the language. I don't know anything about it. And to a, to a large extent, don't really care. <laughs> right? But not those guys. Not, when they came back, they, had the, they actually spoke the same language they did back in this day. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> because God preserved their language. Why did God preserve their language? Because when you get into Scripture... Hebrew scriptures, meaning the Old Testament. When you get into scripture, the, the, the Bible we have is a, is a honest to God, true to original translation. But in the original language, God placed the letters in a sequence so that the sequence of the letters would speak, not just the words they formed. So the language was maintained because of that, because God wanted to maintain his, his, his blueprint on that. Now, so, now so, so, so the prophecies of Scripture do not just come when the prophets say, thus saith the Lord. That's just a part of how God speaks. Again, he speaks through prophetic acts. He speaks through prophetic demonstrations. Um, but we got a little bit of time, and your pastors have on their heart you see, this thing about prophetic end time studies have been something that's been cooking me for a while, and I haven't had many places to go teach this. For one thing, many of the places I go, they need to hear more about the Holy Spirit than anything else. For another thing, that's what they asked me to come in and do, and I want to. I'm happy to do that. Part of the reason why I was so thrilled was because you're one of the first ones to say, I want you to come in and don't just have coffee and tea with me, talk about it, but I, wanna, I, want, my, my, I want my church to come in and hear about this. And, uh, and the moment you did that, you all don't know, but the moment you did that, a few others started asking without knowing that you had. So I know it released something. Remember how I said every meeting is supposed to release something in us? Here's how I'm believing. Every meeting is supposed to release something in me. So I, I know that it, 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 it reorientated me to, to where I could come out and, and start talking about these more, these, these things more, especially with the Generations Church family. Again, why? Because it's on your pastor's heart to do. And if it is, and you are part of this church, there must be something in that for you. So you don't want to disconnect from how God's leading leadership. So if... If God's leading leadership in a whatever kind of way, whatever that means, you want to find out what that is and jump in on that so that you can be a part of that church vision. You see, well, I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to figure out what my vision is. Listen, if you have your own vision while you are part of another thing with another vision, that's called division, two vision. That's what that, that's what that that's mean. You see. So God speaks by prophetic words, obviously. That's that's That's... That's a given. By prophetic acts, by prophetic demonstration, we talked about Hosea and Gomer yesterday, how Hosea, the prophet, was specifically asked of God to go marry him, a, a, a famously unfaithful woman. You know, she, in other, by the time he got her, she was already unfaithful. Think about that. God would, God would ask one of his holy prophets 
to on purpose. Man, you know he heard God, or else why would he, why would he, why would he risk everything? You know, it, it's one of those situations where he either heard God, God, or else it was going to be in the Jerusalem time tomorrow. Look who this prophet's running around with. You know, because think about where he would have to go to even meet her. Right? So by the time Hosea got with... And listen, man, her name was Gomer. <laughs> and I was like, listen, girls, if, you're, if your mom and daddy call you Gomer, they don't like you. <laughs> they, 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 don't, they don't like you. If, if your parents call you, they don't like you. They, they didn't like her as a baby. I think she had rejection issues all the way. Go, like, no one's going to call a baby girl Gomer. I'm just telling you right now. Because I'm thinking Gomer Piles, who I'm thinking about. <laughs> that's just what the baby looked like. I'm like, ooh, ugly baby. <laughs> You know, so God has prophetic acts that He would inspire His prophets to, to demonstrate. You see, the thing is, you can make an utterance, anger a few people, and run away. But when God asks you to marry a prophetic demonstration, that's for life. <laughs> you understand? Like, I was like, man, He is all into His prophetic ministry. He is all in. There is no, there is no turning back with this guy. He is all in. But God wanted to show by that his heart. And so you see how, you see the extent that God goes to to speak to common folk. That's the extent he's willing to go to. That's the extent he's willing to go to. Now when you understand all of that, then you realize if he's willing to go through all of that to speak to us, no wonder, listen now, no wonder as a last resort because people didn't hear him, he had to send his son. That's the height of love. Because all those other acts, demonstrations, utterances, people rejected them. They might have listened to them for a while, but then they walked away like, ah, yeah, don't worry about it. Goldman, you find you another wife. Well, Hosea find another wife. Goldman probably did find another wife, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> that's, a diff <laughs> that's a different message right there. So, so... <laughs> <laughs> so in that, you see how, for, for lack of a better term, how eager and almost desperate God is to reach out to us. That's the height of his love. So when Jesus came, it was after all those prophetic utterances, all those prophetic outreaches had failed. Jesus came. And so Jesus came as the son, and of course, you know what people did. They killed him. In, the same, in, in other words, they treated him the same way they treated the prophets. They killed them too. They killed him. But because this son had divineness about him, and this son did not have the taint of sin in him, death could not hold him. And because death could not hold him, therefore he became that ultimate sacrifice that he who had nothing to do with death would come and experience death so that we who should experience death no longer have to experience death if we would get in with him and get into the stream of what God intended for us, the sons and the daughters of God. See, all of that was a prophetic act. All of that was prophecy in action. The bulk of Old Testament prophecy wasn't just about wars, wasn't just about famine. It really was about the Messiah. Now, with the coming, the return, with the first coming and the second coming of the Messiah, all those other things, the wars and the famines and the earthquakes, all that would go on. But the focus wasn't on all of that. The focus was on the coming of the Messiah. Why? Because in the coming of the Messiah, we are saved from all of that. See, what's the point of God telling me that there's an earthquake coming, there's a famine coming, there's a war coming, and then what am I going to do with all, what am I going to do sitting here stewing with that information, waiting for that to come on me with no help come from heaven? What's the point of, I don't need God to tell me that. You just read the newspapers, you know that's coming anyway. That doesn't do, that doesn't do anything for me. So in prophetic scriptures and studies, and you need a four-week thing to just go through it. Maybe one day we'll do a, like a weekly, like, the full, like every quarter, come in, you know. But in understanding that, you see that the way God arranges things, the way God arranges His letters, His words, 
the seat. Oh, listen to this. Even the way he arranges how he addresses people had prophetic significance. Now, l- l- let me give you a quick, a quick but short. It's probably not going to be short. Who am I kidding? It's me. <laughs> like, but it's, it's quick in my mind, at least. Of how God arranged, and you all will appreciate this because you're a local church, of how God arranged churches so that they would have a prophetic sentence and a prophetic impact on us. Now, if you all came with me to Turkey and those kind of places, you would see, you all know that, that in Revelation um, uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3, that there are seven churches that he talks to, right? Um, people forget that really the, the letters in Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3, there are mention of seven churches there. And people forget that those churches were literally, the, the letters that were written there were literally um, dictated by uh, Jesus to John. So really, in effect, you could call them the epistles of Jesus because they literally were letters from Jesus to those churches. If you came, if you saw how these churches were arranged in the order that they were here in, the, in Revelation, they literally form a horseshoe. All right? It literally is a horseshoe. If you, if you came down to Turkey and, and we toured the place, and you probably need three days to do that, four days to do that, you could, you, it, it's a horseshoe. Now, so in other words, the early church, as they were traveling, here's how we use, as they were traveling, whatever town they came to, they planted the church. Then they would go to the next one, they planted the church there. And they, and they kind of U-turned their way back in, 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 into the sequence of, of a horseshoe. Now you say, well, that's nice and good. That's just how they were traveling. But, here's the part, here's the part. With every church, again, reading Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3, the seven letters to the seven churches that are there. With every church and with every letter and with every message, in sequence, a prophetic message was given. And each of those messages, listen now, corresponds to human history in the church age. So let me give you an example of this. I'm, this is the part I'm going to speak fast. <laughs> and that's what we're thankful for, recordings and, and, and whatnot, right? I'm making up, I'm trying to make up this morning for the past two services of not jumping deep, not, not deep diving into all, all that whole prophetic stuff. And again, I want to apologize on Ryan's behalf. If you submitted a question <laughs> yesterday that we didn't get to, I'd just like to remind you all that he held the files. I did not. <laughs> That's all I'm willing to say about that. Him, that's all I'm willing to say about that. It's not fair. Yes, it is. I've got the microphone and I say it is. <laughs> so seven churches, horse shape, horseshoe shape, right? So the first church, when you, when, you, when you read and when you study that first church, that church... Uh, represent, and, and you hear all about the good things about the church, all the things that, that, that Jesus by John and through John said about the church. It represents the apostolic age. And the first church age I'm talking about was the apostolic age. Why? Because the, the early disciples were still around. That's so good. And everything about the church at Ephesus represented the apostolic age. So God was in effect saying, the first church age, you're going to be apostolic. The early disciples are going to be around. Why was it apostolic? Because it was in the first church age that our our canon of scripture was was being written, was being recorded, was being decided on. All these basic doctrines like the Trinity, all of that was being decided in the first church age, the apostolic church age. Listen, I grew up Catholic, so I'm going to put this plug in. We actually all have something to be thankful to the Catholics about. For one thing, they fought hard and won for the doctrine of the Trinity. If it weren't for them, you and I would be knocking doors, selling out Kingdom magazines right now, and, uh, because the, 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 the non-Trinitarians would have, would, have, would have taken it in. So we actually owe them that. So did you see how everyone brought a supply? That you're still living off, but you might just not know about that. So the first church age, Ephesians, the church at Ephesus was an apostolic church age. 
And Ephesus was an apostolic church. They were strong and solid in doctrine. They were strong and solid in a lot of things. Now, the next church out of the seven, right? The next church from the seven was Smyrna. Smyrna actually means to smear and to press and to crush. And listen now, Smyrna was a persecuted church. Do you know what happened after the apostolic church age? That was when Christians went into persecution. That's when the Romans came down. That's when, that's when the lions and all that started happening. So no, notice how he's actually with the seven churches, a, a prophetic picture of the church age is actually being painted out. Yeah. Right? So historically, Smyrna represented the persecuted church, which is exactly what happened to the church after the apostolic age. Persecution. Mm. Heavy, big, strong. The third epistle to the third church, again, this is Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3. Seven letters, seven churches right there. And these were actual churches that were all actually alive while that was happening. So as Paul was, as, as, Paul, as, 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 as John was writing, these were churches in that neighborhood. So he was addressing each and every one saying, here's what you're, here's what you're going through, here's what God says about you. You know, when you read the seven, seven letters to the seven churches, the fact that Jesus knew everything that was happening in those churches... Like, like on, a, on an intimate detail, that makes, me, that makes me tread carefully in what I do in church. Because it tells me that, it, it tells, it, it tells me that he's actually got his eye on the church, which is a great thing. But that, that sobers me up real quick. So I don't want to come in here and just do my thing and get through another Sunday because he's actually in their midst. Oh, and by the way, that whole emphasis on the Holy Spirit that we've been talking about this whole week, in every one of those seven letters, he, re- he ends it by saying, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. So that tells me that in the church, we're supposed to hear what the Spirit is saying. Because he specifically said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit In other words, if I don't have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying, I won't hear what the Spirit is saying, even though I may be sitting in the pews. Because he was already writing to people who were sitting in the pews. And yet he told them, listen, you got to tell them, make sure, Jesus, Jesus, through John, Jesus personally said, make sure you tell them to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. See, that's why this emphasis of the Holy Spirit, if you take that out of church, we're all in trouble because then I won't be able to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, which means what on earth am I doing here? So my purpose in coming to church is to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Now, after the persecution, the third church was the church at Pergamos. And, And Pergamos, when you read about Pergamos, when you read... Revelation 2 and 3 about Pergamos. Pergamos was an apostate church because Pergamos had allowed all sorts of everything to come in. They had fallen away from the the apostolic age. And historically, historically, after the persecuted church, the church as a whole lost it. They lost the foundational truths. They moved away. They moved away from the doctrine of, of Scripture They just walked right away. Again, consider how God must have ordained for the churches to be planted in order for each one to speak to the age that was going to come. Mm. That kind of tells me that maybe perhaps church ought not be planted just because we think it's a good idea. Church, church, that tells me that perhaps just how we do church, we might have to hear what the Spirit is saying about that because He might have a bigger plan than just for us to have our own little deal. Register a 501c3 and start us one. I'm pretty sure looking at scripture, that's not how they were started. Because if God could ordain, again, if he could ordain even the sequencing, the geographical sequencing of the churches to have a prophetic utterance, man, that's high level stuff that no one could have 
and then the characteristics of each church fit the characteristic of the age that the church represented. How there's no way to fake that. Now, after Pergamum was the church in Tyathira. Now, we've gone through the apostolic church age, the persecuted church age, the ap apostate church age, where they just totally fell away. You know what happened after apostasy? It was, was typified by Thyatira, paganism. The church became pagan. That's when they invited all kind of different everything and then they dressed it up nice. That was what Thyatira was like. They entertained the doctrine of Jezebel in church. They allowed for it. And historically, that's what happened to the church. Again, notice the sequencing of this. It blew my mind when I found out that even in how the churches were placed, I cannot overemphasize this enough, that the fact that the way the churches were planted actually had a prophetic message. And in the pagan church, what we call the Dark Ages, that was when it kicked in. After that came the church in Sardis. And the church in Sardis was a dead church. Jesus actually said that. Isn't that terrible that Jesus would have said that about the church? <laughs> you know, he actually said that. Now what happened after, 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 after the whole Dark Ages and all that? We went dead. Now, dead not as in disappeared, dead as in hard to find a pulse. Okay? Why not dead as in disappeared? Listen, listen. Because God always has a remnant. Always. Why? Because Jesus promised in Matthew 16, I will build my church. Did you know that the church is the only anything that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit themselves are personally said, I'll build that? that it wasn't that way for the tabernacle. It wasn't that way for any of the temples. It wasn't that way for any of the synagogues. Only the church did Jesus say, I'll build it. And because he said, I'm the one that's going to build it, at no point in any of this history was the church ever removed from the earth. There was always a remnant. There was always a pocket. A lot of them had to hide so that they wouldn't be snuffed out. But there was always a remnant of someone somewhere worshipping the true God to the best of their ability with the scriptures they had available to them. So the church of Jesus Christ has never been wiped out. Ever. So when I say they were dead, what I mean is that the main body was dead, but there were always pockets of believers hidden somewhere House churches, I would imagine they would almost be around this size sometimes when I look around. See, that's why sometimes when I get around groups and they're so convinced that how they do church is church, a lot of how I think is, no, that's your culture. That's not church, church. I go to a lot of places where they, they like their tambourines, they like their flags, and they like and all that kind of thing. And they're like, this is church. And I'm like, no, that's culture. Because if they did that back then, the Romans would have found them and killed them. <laughs> it couldn't be church. It just couldn't be because they had to do it quiet. You know, you try tambourining without the little, they're, they're, just try, they're gonna find you and you're gonna be lion food. Now, is that wrong? No, because again, every culture, every age ought to express what we feel is church. You see? So whatever background a person is from, whatever generation that person is from, they have to express church from whatever is real to them. So like when I go over to New Mexico, and I do, I do a lot go to New Mexico because the food is good there. But I go to New Mexico, plenty. They express church different. When I'm in Springfield, they express, and all of that's right because people are expressing church. See, church isn't the form of how we express it. It's an expression of the heart. It's an expression of the heart. And that's what keeps church alive. So therefore, I don't need to come over to your county and tell you how to do church based on my county. Because however you all do it, is what, whatever's real for you, that's real for you. There is not the outward form of what we call church. That's why you, you go to some church, and I've been to different places, you know, where, where, where they, like I said, they like their flags. I go to some other places where they don't even like people. 
keyboards. That they probably from from a certain mindset of a certain generation, and I'm not suggesting that you ought to stay there, but if that's where they are, that's where you are. I kind of have a feeling that wherever you are, wherever I am, God can find me. I'm kind of at the persuasion that how, whatever age I'm stuck in, I have a feeling that if I offer it up to God, He'll receive it anyway. So I don't always have to be current because the thing about being current is that it changes all the time. <laughs> you know? So I don't always have to be the trendiest one in the room. I just have to be current in my heart, in my relationship with Him. And if I'm current in my relationship with him, my expression will always be accepted. So after, after Sardis, the dead church, came Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love. You know what the church of Philadelphia was known for? Missions. You know what happened after the church went dead? Reformers like Martin Luther, John Wycliffe, John Knox, all these people started rising up. And before you know it, there was a worldwide missions movement, just like in Philadelphia. And out of that deadness came a whole sweeping of evangelism across the globe. You see how every church said something. Every church had... That grabs me, that the positions of the church had a prophetic utterance for us. Now, all you eager beaver Bible students, this is the part that should get you and cause you to study and cause you to pray. The last church after Philadelphia is the church of Laodicea. And that would then put us in that age of Laodicea. Let's go to the church of Laodicea and see, shall we? Because if you wanted to talk prophetic scriptures and where the church is, that would mean we would be at that church age now of Laodicea. Revelation 3 and verse 14. And assuming that the previous six churches were correct, in their prophetic pronouncements over the church age, again, we would now be at age number seven. We would be now at church number seven, which would be you and me. So this is the one we ought to be intensely interested in. So here's, what, here's the description of the church at Laodicea. And to the angel of the church of, this is verse 14, Revelation 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write this. These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Listen now. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, and I wish you could be cold or hot. The Laodiceans had a water system running through, and you can still go to the ruins now and see, they had a water system running through, uh, I guess you would call it a town. And the spring from which it came from, if you just scooped it up, it tastes bad enough to make you sick. So they would either heat the water and drink it that way, or drink it cold. Here's what Jesus said. I know your works, verse 15. I know your works, for you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you would be cold or hot. And you have to think, 
Does that describe the age we're in, where people are ah, lukewarm? We don't have to be too hot, but don't get too cold and everything's going to be okay. Don't you find it unusual that Jesus actually said, I would that you rather be cold or hot? He didn't say, I would rather that you be hot. Why was that? Because if you're hot, everyone will know it. But if you're cold, at least you'll know it. But if you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, you'll think you're all that when you're not. You'll think you're someone going somewhere to do something. And the reality is you're not. And when I meditate this, it sobers me quick. Because I ask myself, I don't want to be neither cold nor hot. Tell me which one I am. How, how, how much of an offense is this? Verse 16, so then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. What are the things that people vomit out? Hear me. The things that people vomit out are things that don't agree with their system. <laughs> and it makes me think, now again, whatever your theology is, whatever, whatever, whatever your ideology is, I would ask you to read this in context and realize that he was talking to the church because he said so. He specifically said to the angel of, verse 14, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write this. So this was church folk like you and me. And I have to believe because they were so close towards history, these were spirit-filled church folk, spoke in tongues, again, like you and me. And so he just said, you're not cold, you're not hot, you think you're all that, and it's such an offense to me at the time that you're living in, the way you're living, I almost have to vomit you out of my mouth. Listen to, what, listen to what they say and see if this does not describe the church. Uh, hear me. When I say the church, I don't mean GC. I mean the church universal. I mean the Catholic church, right? Catholic means universal, by the way. Right. Catholic means universal, by the way. So we're all Catholic. We might not all be Roman Catholic, but we are all Catholic. You understand that? So don't anyone freak out and run out from me and like, oh, my Lord, they, GC turned Catholic. I knew there was something when they brought their speaker in. I knew he was up to something. <laughs> kept telling us how Catholic he was. <laughs> we knew they were up to something. That little cross up there, we saw that. <laughs> Look at Jesus' description of the church and see if it doesn't describe the church today. Listen. Verse 17. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and I have need for nothing, did you know that historically, today, 2022, the Church of Jesus Christ is as rich as we've ever become? We have numbers that we've never had before. We got money we've never had before. We got influence we never had before. Yet look what the Laodicean Church said. Because we're rich, we've become wealthy. They became wealthy. In other words, they were not. Notice, they were not wealthy to begin with. They became wealthy. They gained that wealth. They inherited that wealth. They believed that wealth. They confessed that wealth. They prophesied that wealth and got it. They sold for that wealth and got it. They became wealthy. And then they said, we have need of nothing. We don't need the Holy Spirit in this. The Holy Spirit will scare people. Come to church. We, we, we don't want to talk about the blood of Jesus at church. That will, scare, that will scare people in church. No, we need to preach us a good, positive, uplifting message and tell you how good you are. Because we're complete. That, that, saying, that saying bugs me. I am complete. You hear people say that? I'm complete. 
it bugs me. It bugs me because you're not complete. I know you're not complete because you've got to spend all your time trying to convince me you're complete to, to, try and, to try and fill some sort of gap in you. In Him, I'm complete. Out of Him, I'm broken and bleeding in every possible way. I'm complete. No, you're not. If you were complete, you wouldn't be running the street acting the way you are. But that's exactly what they were saying. We don't need anything. We're good. We're okay. We're okay. We're complete. We've got money. We've got people. We've got the buildings. We've got the crowds. We fill stadiums. Again, nothing wrong with all of that. Nothing wrong with all of that. The problem is when you substitute that for the presence of God and say, listen, we've got all of this. Holy Spirit, you can come next week. We don't need you right now. Because you say, verse 17, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Listen, and you do not know that you are wretched. You are miserable. You are poor. You are blind. And you're naked. And sometimes when I, I see what people say is preaching, I think of this verse and I think I just spent an hour listening to nothing that brought me closer to Jesus. It made me, it rah rah me into feeling good about myself, but I didn't know my Savior any better. I didn't, I didn't come to know Jesus any better after that. I didn't come to know the flow of the Spirit of God any better after that. I knew nothing about the Bible any better after that. I, I didn't know I didn't know any of that, but, but I felt prepped up that I was a good person. And emotionally, I, for a little while, then I got to come back for, 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 for I got to listen to another podcast to pump me up again. I counsel you, verse 18, to buy from me gold refined in the fire. In other words, they had money enough to spend to buy gold. He didn't have to give it to them. So that tells me that they were taking the resources they had and spending it on things that were not his gold. And he was saying, look, you're putting the resources you have into all these other things that is not divine gold. Why not put the resources you have into the things that count for the kingdom? counsel from you to buy me from me gold refined in the fire so you so that tells me they've been buying things that were not refined in the fire they've been buying things that wouldn't last they've been giving their, their lives into things that that didn't count for what it should why then he says so that you might be rich now the irony is they already thought they were rich and he said no you're not rich you're poorer than you think you're so poor, you don't know how poor you are. So could it be that in the midst of wealth, a person can be poor? Yeah, apparently, scripturally. You, you apparently could have a lot, but have nothing in, 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 in his sight. Now hear me, I'm all for God prospering you. I'm all for God meeting your needs. I'm all for God taking care of you. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is everything your father should, he, he's all of that. But that's not all he is. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you might be rich and white garments that you might be clothed. In other words, what you're wearing now, as dressed as you are, you're still naked. Boy, you can turn on the TV and see people who are dressed but still naked. Right? Right? Yeah. That you might be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. So that means that the shame of their nakedness had not yet been revealed, but was going to be. So he was trying to save them from the shame of their nakedness. 
Now look at the last part. You want to talk about something sharp that just pierces the heart. Look at this. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might see. Here's the irony of it. Laod uh, Laodicea, part of the way they made their money was that they, they, they manufactured an eye salve, something you put on the eyes that was apparently good for your eyes, and they exported them to everyone else. So they were a place known for exporting this thing, you, this ointment you put on your eyes to help do something for your eyes. And he's now telling them, for all that exporting you do, you need to, be, you need to get me some eye salve for me because you're blind. So he knew the intimate details of these people. Doesn't that sound like the church age of today where we export so many of our beliefs and so many of our practices around the world? We export how we should worship. We export preaching. We export Bible this and Bible that and missions this and missions that and everything else. And, and he said, for all you're exporting, the thing you're exporting doesn't even work for you. And you're more blind than the people you're exporting that eye salve to, that eye ointment to. Some of this sound familiar? When, when, you, when you think about what, what you know in the, in the age that we live in, yeah. does it kind of describe us a little bit in some parts, perhaps? Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke. And chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. So he's telling them here, I'm telling you you're blind and naked out of my love for you. So that you don't shame yourself. I'm telling you you're neither hot nor, nor cold. So that you don't end up vomited out of the body. He says, I love you enough to tell you the truth because apparently there were not people who loved them enough to tell them that. So he said, I love you enough to tell you the truth. This is the pathetic condition in which you are in that you don't know about because you've hidden yourself in layers and layers and layers and layers of the world's wealth and the world's gold and the world's glitter. You don't see your true state anymore. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Don't you love that all he said all of that to bring them to a place of coming back to him? He said all of that not to condemn them. He simply said that to say, come back. Come back to where you used to be. You see, what I love about these prophetic scriptures is that these are prophetic scriptures about us, me, you and me right now. Again, remember the sequence in which these churches were placed. This is the last one. This is the last one. After chapter 3, John is caught up into heaven. That represents the rapture, the taking away of the church. So the last age, the Laodicean age that you and I are at, after chapter 3, boom, the next thing, they're in heaven. Apparently, here's where we are, folks. That's why he said... Be zealous. Repent. Why? Because chapter 4 is coming. And in chapter 4, you won't be there anymore. You'll be up here. Because the very next thing that happened in chapter 4, John looked up and the voice said, Come up! Don't you love that God said, Come up, not I'm coming down. So we're going up before he comes down. After chapter 4, once we're done with this, we're not done yet, but once we're done with this, after chapter 4, you don't see the church on earth anymore. Every reference to the church, they're already in heaven. After, after chapter, once he's done with this, once he's done with chapter 3, from chapter 4 on, you don't see the church anywhere on earth. You see a lot of stuff going on on the earth, but the church isn't there anymore. They're, they're gone. Every time you see any kind of reference in Revelation to the church, they're already up there. So something's cooking with this Laodicean church. So that tells me I maybe want to pay attention to this 
naked, wretched, blind message that he's bringing across and saying, listen, you, you want to turn this around real quick because come chapter 4, you're not supposed to be there anymore. Again, verse 20. This is the one we've been quoting the whole week. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So the Laodicean church, for all their money, for all their wealth, for all their influence, they actually were the one that successfully locked him out of the church. After seven church ages, they got the job done. They locked him out. What persecution couldn't do? What paganism couldn't do? What, 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 what all, all that deadness couldn't do? The rich church was able to do it. They, 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 they were the ones who successfully locked him out because this was the only one that he was not going to come back in on. The rest of them, he was still, with all the mess that was going on, he didn't have to ask me back in. Now you see why they were lukewarm, because he was no longer in their midst. Now you see why they were neither hot, neither cold, and didn't know about it, because he was no longer in their midst. That's why now, after saying all of that, he had to politely knock the door and say, can I come back in, please? Because he just told them, he says, the, the verse just before that, he said, be zealous, repent. What was repentance? Let me back in your heart. That was his definition. Let me back in. Let me back in. You locked me out. And you so blind, you don't know you locked me out. That's how blind you are. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, so the step is not just opening doors. If anyone hears my voice, notice he didn't say, if anyone hears my knocking. Right? Didn't say, if anyone hears the knocking. He said, if anyone hears my voice. In other words, me opening the door is not in response to a knocking, it's not in response to a need, it's not in, in response to something that I don't feel. It's in response to me hearing him. So this immediately brings the speaking ability of the Holy Spirit back to the churches you and I live in. Because if I don't hear, apparently, if I don't hear him, I couldn't open the door. Right, that's right. And if I don't open the door, he's stuck outside. I'm stuck lukewarm inside. With all my wealth and all my fine, fine everything, I'm in here thinking I am all that, except that I am all that without him because he's outside. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. Notice he didn't say, I will come into the building, didn't say, I will come into the church. He said, I will come in to him. He moved it from the organization, he moved it from the structure to the person. Now, that is good, but it does concern me a little bit. Because the way this ends, he didn't come back to the church. He came back to individuals, but he didn't, came back, he didn't come back to the organization. Notice how, this is, notice how this is worded. So apparently, there was some sort of remnant that heard him, opened the door, and he came back into the remnant. Because... So my, that's why I've told you all this whole week. My main focus is that the door of my heart be open. You understand that? I, I am my priority. You're looking at it right here, me. As much as I love you all, I got to make sure my door's open. Again, read the sequencing of that. It almost don't make sense. I'm knocking at the door, but I'll come into him. Notice how he shifted. I will come in and dine with him. So that speak of fellowship. And he with me. Notice it isn't a one-way conversation. I'm not just dining with you, you're dining with me. 
So again, relationship in the church is not just all you listening or all him listening. He wants to have relationship with us. So what, what did all of that come down to? All of that tells me that the fact that he wanted to come in, that means he was outside. The fact that he wanted to dine, that means he wasn't dining with them. The fact that he wanted to have fellowship with them, meaning I talk to you, you talk to me, that tells me he wasn't having any of that with, with, with this particular church, the later this season. In other words, he was locked out, hadn't eaten with them, and wasn't in fellowship with them, wasn't in communication with them. Not the prettiest picture out here. Not, 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 not the way you would want to end church number seven. Verse 21, this is a promise. This is a promise. All the letters, all the churches, he gives them a promise. Verse, verse 21, to him, not to them. Again, he broke it down to the individual. To him who overcome. I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I have overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. In other words, he's saying, if you can, if you can shake yourself loose from this Laodicean lukewarmness, I've got a seat with your name on it right by me. That, that, that speak to me of authority that speak to me of divine position, that speaks to me of what, God's closeness, because I'm sitting next to him now. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, he was saying, trade your fake prosperity and self-confidence for intimacy with me. Get rid of all... Trade what you, what you see with these eyes, get you, get, get you healed so you can see properly and have intimacy with me. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation 4 verse 1, After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. Isn't it ironic that Jesus was just talking about knocking on a door that he couldn't get into and now here, Revelation 4, he says, I have a door you can come into and my door's open, you don't have to knock on it. Your door I got to knock because you locked me out, but my door I'm going to leave open for you. What love yeah. that he would knock on my door, but I don't have to knock on his door. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like a trumpet speaking to me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things that must take place after this. After this, you don't see the church in any of in anything on the earth anymore. They're, they're caught up. So John, representing the church, caught up to heaven. So apparently, on God's prophetic time clock, after chapter 3 comes chapter 4. Now, all that stuff you're going to read in Revelation, all that, all the the seven vials, the seven bowls, all, all that. By the, I have good news for you. All that happens after chapter 4. All that happens after John's been called up. So we get to look down and see what's happening, except that we're not down with them while it's happening. Because we've been called up in chapter 4. And again, you have to understand that however God arranges things, there is sequencing in how he does things. It's not as random as people think it is. There is actual, again, we just proved it with the seven churches. The way, even the way the churches were planted, there was sequencing in them. I want intimacy with him. That's why I talk about the Holy Spirit. Outside of the Holy Spirit, I have no avenue to be intimate with Him. 
I have no wherewithal to pray. I don't know how to do that outside of the Holy Spirit. I don't have the ability. Roman 8 tells me that, that I don't even know what to pray for as I ought. Yeah. I'm literally, so people who think they, they're going to cook up a prayer list and, and, and tell God all that he needs to be done, they do not know what they're talking about. Because Roman tells us that outside of the Holy Spirit, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to give outside of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he's the prime giver. We, we heard that beautifully put out this one. He's the prime giver. So he's teaching me how to give. Outside of God, I don't have the ability to love. Why? Because he's the prime source of love. Outside, I don't have anything that you think I ought to have outside of him. And the way I get and tap into any of that is not by good efforts, it's not by good intention, it's not by me thinking of myself better, it's by me developing a relationship with God on the inside through the person of the Holy Spirit. That's why He put the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, so we could develop and know Him. So when, when people cut out, notice I said when people, I didn't say you, when people cut out the Holy Spirit out of their life, out of their church services, out of whatever they want to do for God, they enter into something else, can't live without. In fact, I was over in Springfield, Illinois, and I was telling the pastors over there, I said, did you know, did you know that the scriptural definition for witchcraft, the scriptural definition for witchcraft is any time anyone tries to move into anything in the Spirit outside of the Holy Spirit. Witchcraft is anytime, anything, anyone, anywhere tries to move into the Spirit outside of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit. And when you read John, uh, uh, R R R Revelation 2 and 3, you see witchcraft played a big part. A, a big part in all that was cooking in there. Let me give you one last verse. Let me give you one last verse. Because we want to beat the Baptist to lunch. <laughs> we want to do that for sure. We're not going to let them get in there. Let me give him beat the Baptist to lunch. <laughs> I put this for you for your future study. Revelation is the only book in the Bible that has its own divine outline. And the divine outline is found in Revelation 1, verse 19. Revelation 1, verse 19 says, Write the things, in other words, he was telling him to write the book of Revelation, write the things which you have seen. What were the things which he have seen? Chapter 1. And the things which are, what are the things that are? They are the seven churches, chapter 2 and 3. And then he says, write the things which will take place after this. In other words, starting in chapter 4, we're going into after this. So he gave him a divine outline of the book. All things being equal, a lot of people want to concentrate on what happened after chapter 4. Because they want to know about the Antichrist. They want to know about the Mark of the Beast. They want to know about, about the Gog Magog War. They want to know about the, 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 the army marching. They want to know all that. Listen, you might want to just prep yourself with chapter 2 and 3 a little bit. Because once we hit into chapter 4, <laughs> there isn't a, a U-turn come back on that. Once chapter 4 rolls in, it rolls. Did you know that there are some things that we don't need to believe God for? Some things are going to happen regardless of whether you believe or not. Whether you make faith confession or not, something's going to happen. The coming of Jesus Christ is one of those things. Even if all the people didn't believe it, He was going to come anyway. At the appointed time, He was going to come anyway. Can I tell you this? Some of these things you study about in end times, you can speak the blessing and protection of God over you, but you can't turn them around. There are some things that are going to happen by the divine sovereign will of God that must happen to fit into the overall picture of the redemption of the earth, of the restoration of mankind, of the, of the redeeming of the creation that Roman talked about. Some of those things you cannot believe yourself out of. You can believe for you to be protected while they're happening, but you cannot believe regions out of that. Now, 
Again, hear me. I told you in, in, in the conference we've been having that the three main groups of people on the earth, the church, the Jews, and the nations. And the nations are the people with no, no covenant. The Jews are the people of the old covenant. The church is the people of the new covenant, right? We already said that a couple of times. You have to have that understanding when you read scripture because every part of scripture, while it applies to everyone, actually speaks to only one. Hear that again. Every part of scripture, while it applies to everyone, actually speaks to only one. You know that part where it says, hey, my people will humble themselves and, and repent. And do you know that in, in context, that was actually talking about Israel. It wasn't talking about just random people come together. Now, can you take the principle from that and humble yourself? And, yes, you can. But in context of that, the only thing that he's going to say, that the only land in that sense, the only land, I'm talking about actual earth, actually is Israel. Because they, they're the only ones with that promise. Now, can, can he, are we believing for a move? Are we believing for an awakening? Yes. But think about this. Many times I've seen, hear my heart, but many times I've seen that when believers in a certain country call for an awakening or call for a revival, what they mean is we want an awakening and a revival for our land without many times realizing that in other lands there is great revival. The problem with that thinking is that then you've located yourself by the land you live in instead of by the biblical classification of humans, either the church, the Jews, or the nations. And if you are in the church, why would I care if there's, if there, if, if there's it doesn't matter where in the world there's revival. I'm a part of the church. If they're having a revival, I'm having a revival. But if you're only thinking natural, it's got to be my town. past couple of weeks, just because I enjoy doing that, I've been watching videos and different ones of some brothers over there in Africa. They're having one, two, three, four, five hundred thousand people at, on a Sunday morning. Here we are calling for revival to sweep the earth because we're having a hard time understanding it already happening. Oh, it's got to happen here or else we've got to have a great awakening. Yes, we ought to have a love for the land we're living in. But the land we're living in actually scripturally doesn't define us. Again, there's only three categories. You're either the church, you're either the Jews, or you're either the, the, the heathen nations. Pick one. And if you're the church, the church is bigger than the town you're living in. Now again, if you knew me at all, I'm a regional thinker. And when I work with churches, I think regionally. All the pastors who were here last night um, from Springfield, we're coming together because I told them, I said, we're believing for the river to flow in the region. So I, I don't have any issue with believing for a region. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this, con this idea of praying for an awakening, praying for revival is bigger than just a part of little earth that you live on. And I have, to, I have to learn. I have to learn to start identifying with the group that God put me in, the church. I'm not the, I will not be divided. I will not be classified by race. I will not be classified by the passport I hold. I will not be classified by the, the economic, social. I must be classified church, Jews, nations. Pick one. So in Revelation, and I'm going to close with this. In Revelation, you see the church in the throne room. You see the nations at war. And you see Israel gathered together. You see the three categories. And guys, I, 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 I go back far enough to remember when you could go to church on a Sunday morning and the pastor would preach, Jesus is coming soon. I, I remember that. I remember far back enough where I, you could go back, you could go back on a, Sunday, on a Sunday morning like this and you would hear about live right because, because, because your redemption drew. I remember those days. 
I'm having a hard time hearing because no one ever says that anymore. No one ever dare talk about those. I don't know if it's don't dare or don't know. To talk. I don't know which one it is. I don't dare judge them. I'm just saying that you don't hardly hear them anymore nowadays. But your pastors, your pastors actually wanted to put a conference on to talk about the times you live in. That sets you all apart. The fact that your pastors would call for, for me like this. I think it's particularly our camp because I know that there's some, there some good denominational folk who still, who still talk about it hard. Yeah. They still do. And they're good scholars while they're talking about it too. They're not, they're not half-baked crazy, the Lord told me. No, they actually know what the scripture says about it. You know what I'm saying? You know? And sometimes I got to tell you, some of us spirit-filled, tongue-talking, running around the room folk, it's almost embarrassing how little of the Bible we actually know. And here we claim to have the Holy Spirit and how He's the reveal of all truth. And down the street, some of our, our, our more denominational folk, they can crack the book open and study it by the book. We're having a good Sunday if we just know, know a verse. But your pastors, that's not an indictment against anyone. You understand that? I'm just giving you a general observation. So don't think of anyone because I wasn't thinking of anyone. That's a general observation. General observation. But your pastors had the gall to call for a conference and talk about the end times. That makes you all different. But that also makes you responsible. <laughs> that also makes you responsible. Because now you might know more stuff than people down the road who don't. So my heart for you is to, that you be zealous and turn around. That's all that word means, turn around. That's all that word means, turn around. My heart for you is what the heart of Jesus had for the Laodicean church. Let him heal your eyes so that you see. Let him clothe you so you don't be naked. My heart for you is what Jesus had for the Laodicean church, that you would trade your finery for refined gold from him. My heart for you is what Jesus had for the Laodicean church, that you would open the door of your heart so he can come in and sup with you and fellowship with you and talk with you and be with you and be to you everything that you need him to be. Sometimes we talk too much about how we have Jesus. I think sometimes it's good for us to go back and remember that we need Him. That we actually need a Savior. You understand? And the Savior came for me, and I am saved, but there is an aspect of all of us that needs to go on getting saved. Can you, I'm not the only one in the room. I need my Savior. And that don't make me weak for saying it. He's not my emotional clutch. He's not my any. I need a savior. I need a savior because man by default of how they are, there is, there is in the system of how man is now, not how God ori originally created it, but there is in the system of how God created him now, there is a need of us to self-destruct. So all, all the prep rallies you attend telling you how good you are, how complete you are, all, all, none of, all of that is just trying to psych you over into something that tomorrow morning you're going to wake up and remember you're not, which is why you've got to keep listening to that all the time over and over, how complete you are, how complete you are. No, outside of Him, you're broken. But the good news is that in Him, you can be complete, and if you will walk with Him, you can stay complete. This is the message of eschatology and the end times. It isn't about the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and earthquake and famine and, and, and... No, the message of the end times in, for the church is that we look forward to His coming. We are looking for unto the coming of the Lord. But in doing that, in looking for His coming, I live like I'm ready to go. That alone sets you all apart because not too many want to talk about these things anymore. That alone makes you all different because you, you actually came to a church, are a part of a church that 
bothers to dig a little bit deeper than just to make you feel good about your little self. And sometimes in order to get you to where you're supposed to be, you need to know how naked and blind you are to begin with. We've overdone this nonsense of, 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 of denying our wretchedness outside of Christ. Listen, if you don't even admit that there is a mountain, what mountain is there for you to speak to? Me saying that there's a mountain is not a bad confession. Me saying that there's a mountain is simply acknowledging what I need to speak to to have removed. You've got too many people denying. No, no, I'm, I'm, not, there's, I'm not sick. I'm not blind. I'm, perf I'm perfect the way I am. No, you're not. If you were perfect the way you are, you wouldn't need the Savior. You see how we've overplayed our hand on that and think just like the church in this year, thought we were something we were not. <laughs> Your pastors love you enough to talk about the times you live in. And so I felt to do it this way, Pastor Denise and Pastor Duan, you all need to come and close the service however you see fit. Whether that means to pray with them and pray for them or pray over them, and anyone else you may feel to call however you want to do that. But this is, listen, it's important that they lead this part of the service because they're the local shepherds in the church. I fly out tomorrow morning. You understand that? So your responsibility isn't to me. Your accountability isn't to me. It's to the local pastors because they're the ones who got to face you every week. They have to wrap this in a way that fits GC. They have to lead you in this. Cons we don't even hear the word consecrate anymore in church nowadays, hardly ever. You know, when was the last time we, we even heard? I mean, I'm pretty sure there's a generation grow up, don't know what that word means. Consecrate. Concert what? Concert. Concerts they know. You guys are the shepherds of, that God plays in here. You heard what God said. You all wrap it. You know your church best, how they need to respond and how you need to respond. I love you. Come on up, pastors, whoever you want, however you want to do that. Oh, yes. Go ahead. You know, I really sensed when when Dr. Tan was coming, that uh, the word that kept coming up was reset. Reset. And, and the Lord has said, you've been calling for revival. You've been calling uh, for change in the region. But, but there needs to be a reset. There needs to be a changing in your mind. And uh, that was just confirmation today that um, as a believer, we're not as far as we believe we are. And uh, we, we've been asking for this, and it's been interesting. That we've been asking for signs and wonders. He said, I want to give you signs and wonders. But he said, you need to prepare your heart to receive it. And uh, he said, you want to see miracles happen on, on a weekly basis. He said, I want to give you miracles on a weekly basis, but there needs to be a reset that happens within you. And I just really sense that... Uh, I'm not going to pray over everybody, but we can do it individually right where you are in your seat and say this, I'm ready for a move of God. And me personally, not just in the region, but me personally. And, uh, and I'm not sure if you have uh, something as well, but uh, we're going to pray collectively over everybody. But are you guys ready to, to see the church in the position it needs to be in? Is that so awesome that it's not declining? But it's rising. That's what I believe. And uh, this isn't our darker day. This is our finer day. And I, I love that it, yeah, it's going to get darker, but what does that mean? Yes. We're going to be brighter. We're going to be a brighter light. Go ahead. You're on. Thank you. You know, um, I want to be in tandem with what Pastor had uh, just shared. But I do believe that there's something about this outward demonstration yeah. of movement forward and so could we get this moved out of the way and this this front 
Um, oh. Guys, thank you so much. And I know it's a little bit of a muscle there, but... And can we stand to our feet? Can we do that? Yeah, we can do that. <clears throat> it's going to be tough, yeah. Let them do it. They got it. It is heavy. And worship team, can you come and, and lay that back behind us? That would be so great. At least a pad behind us. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thank you, Father. And I'm so grateful to you all for not uh, wanting to be in a rush, but you're wanting to take this moment to pause and really take heed to what was just not only preached, but prophesied. Can we just bow our heads and our, our hearts more importantly right now yes. in this moment and allow him to minister to us in a way there's no music in the background just yet. There's no atmosphere per se created, but you have the opportunity to get alone with your God in this moment. Yes. And Father, we collectively say that you're the revealer of men's hearts. And as you peered through the annals of time, you were able to look into the condition, the heart condition of the church and to each of us individually as we stand here in this moment. And as was spoken earlier, you can literally peel back the layers and allow us to see the condition of our hearts as you see the condition of our hearts. And Father, we desire to not be glossed over, to not be seared as with a hot iron, to not be without feeling, without the opportunity to respond to the prick of the Holy Spirit and the conviction of men's hearts. Hallelujah. And so as a collective response, and pastor, is this okay? If oh, they sure. just come forward, yeah. and if that's just a step forward to you, it would be as if you're already transported over into Revelation chapter 4, and he's saying, come up. So by way of us being in this earth realm, we're stepping forward and we're saying, I'm coming forward. And so if you'll do that as an act of worship, as an act of submission, and come forward, even right now as I'm saying that, responding to that call, coming forward. And for you, that outward demonstration might be with an upraised hand. It might be with a bended knee. It might be that you even lay your body prostrate before the Lord. As an act of submission, leaving behind that old life, that old lukewarm life and saying, Father, I desire to be impassioned for you, fired for you, zealous for you, and I repent. Leaving that old life. Thank you, Father, that you wash us, that you cleanse us anew, refresh us anew. And whatever movement, whatever form and shape that takes for you today, I believe your Savior is meeting you right where you're at. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father. Glory to God for repentant hearts, for a fired up church, yes. for a passionate church. Thank you, Jesus. We declare as an act of our will. Yes, thank you, Father. That from this moment forward, we will no longer allow ourselves to simply be warmed by a fire that just comforts us. But instead, it sets us ablaze. For some of you, I sense by the Spirit of God, you're going to have to go home and you're going to have to make some things right. And you're going to have to do some things. And there might be some purging and there might be some getting rid of some things. And there might be some, some you know, relational issues that you might need to tend to. But He'll grace you. 
He'll equip you. Yes. And there will be an ease to that stepping out in obedience. And Father, we pray that there would be such a radical obedience, such a quick work, such a haste. It's time to make haste toward this place of obedience. There is no time left to rest on our laurels. It's time to get our families saved. It's time to get our coworkers saved. It's time to allow our mouthpieces to be used for the glory of God. He will fill you in ways you cannot even imagine. And it will be as if you stepped outside of yourself and He will be allowed to work through you in ways that will bring Him glory. And there is in this that place of consecration, dedication, and separation. Because He has called you uncommon. You are not to be in tandem with the world. You are not to be called common anymore. You are uncommon. You are a separated people for His work and His purpose. And though you be called radical, you'll receive it with joy. Thank you, Father. Let it be so. Let it be said. Have your way. In this place and in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. That your banner over us is raised high. Yes. Thank you, Father. We allow you to do what only you can do. Thank you. you. Got it? Thank you, Father. I really sense the word alignment is coming up because life can go on and, and the question I need to ask is, what is your first love? What's your first love? What consumes your time in the morning? What consumes your thoughts every day? Is it your work? He says, set that aside. Thank you, Father. There's an alignment today. If you want to see the move, you've got to have an alignment. If you want this church to be the church it talked about in Acts, there needs to be an alignment. And church, let me say this. There's a cost to flowing in the Holy Ghost and a movement of God. There's going to be a cost. But here's what's really great. He says, I'm knocking. I'm equipping. I'm making you ready. All you have to do is step in and I'll meet you. So coming forward was basically just a way to say, Lord, me, choose me. I'm ready. I'm available. For you, if you're standing outside of the front right now, that's okay. But he said, if you'll be bold and you'll step and move forward, I'll meet you where you're at. New gifts, new talents. I'll bring things to your remembrance that you've long forgotten. Thank you, Father. Anybody got dreams and desires you once thought you would be moved, used by God? He says, I've waited so long for you to recognize for your gifts and calls. He said, if you'll come, I'll meet you with that. Can I just pray over you guys? We just speak, Holy Spirit, move right now through our midst i really sense he says i'm moving in the room can you recognize me i'm flowing right now can you recognize me turn your ear to me and this is what i love he says you know my voice you might have been listening to a different voice you know my voice thank you father 
So Lord, we ask today this is a declaration day. Father, we speak right now from our heart that there's a change from this day forward. We put you first, your agenda, your plans, your purposes. And the Lord says, what will I give you in return? The promises in the word is what I'll give you. I'll give you the fruit of the earth. I'll give you peace and joy in your life. Your children will serve me with their whole heart. That your bodies will be healed, healthy, and whole. That salvation will come to your family. Yes. I'll say this at the end. I just, the Lord says this. Don't fake it till you make it anymore. Don't, don't do that. He said, I'm waiting for you to run towards me. And he said, you'll have a genuine relationship with me. Wouldn't that be sweet? Wouldn't that have to pretend we can have a genuine relationship with him. Jude, the book of Jude, it's, it's just one chapter and it says that we're to build ourselves up on our most holy faith, praying in the spirit. And I just really sense right now that there are some in the room that you've been baptized in the spirit in times past, but you've not been praying much in the spirit as of late. Yeah. But if this is the day and the hour that you're going to have to, if there's anything that's been reiterated again and again and again, you're going to have to, we are going to have to rely the whole of our person on the person of the Holy Spirit. And that's this, that we make much of praying in the Spirit. So can we lift our voices right now? And if you've not been baptized in the Spirit, or perhaps you've not prayed out in, you know, in, in recent times or maybe ever, I just believe that He's going to fill you right now. Yeah, just so fill you a fresh, fill you a new right now. And so, Father, we do as Jude commended us to, called us to, to build ourselves up on our most holy faith. Oh, we recharge. Father, we thank you for a fresh infilling. An infilling in such a way that we overflow on all those that are in our spheres of influence. Hallelujah. And as your word says, that it's in him, in the spirit, yes, that we live and we move and we have our very being. And so we live in this place. We live in this place called in the spirit. And we make much of praying in the spirit. Hallelujah. Yes. And we're just going to ask if maybe, if that's you, would you just acknowledge and say, the Lord filled me afresh right now? Would you just lift your hand up and then now? Thank you for those hands. The yeah. Lord filled you maybe for the first time or afresh right now. Thank you for those hands. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. And so I just really sense this, guys. We're going to pray a blessing over you. We're going to get to the doors. But Donovan, if you can continue to lay that pad, we're going to leave this atmosphere just like this. If you want to stay in the presence of God as it, you know these, these minutes unfold and just allow him to continue and to finish that work he started in you this morning, don't rush. Don't rush out the door. And, and, and let me say this, although we love community, don't be so bent on just wanting to get with your friend here in this moment. Just, just allow yourself to be with the friend, your Jesus right now in this moment. And so we pray Nehemiah's prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace to the praise of his name to the building of his church 
We thank you, Father, that we can go in peace to love and serve you and each other. 